Back in 2015, 181 countries got together at the COP21 United Nations Climate Conference and ratified what's now known as the Paris Agreement. As many of you already know, the plan was to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with an even more ambitious target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. To reach that target, our world leaders first had to agree what the total carbon budget was so that they had something to aim at when it came to carbon dioxide reductions. The number that the scientists told us would keep us below 2 degrees Celsius was 1200 gigatons. And bear in mind we emit nearly 40 billion tons a year at the moment. The science also revealed that to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius meant a carbon budget of somewhere between 400 and 600 billion tons of CO2 in total. And the United Nations and IPCC told us that hitting that target would require a 45% emission reduction by 2030 and net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And that means immediately beginning the process of decarbonizing energy, industry, transport and agriculture. But with coal still generating 40% of the world's electricity and 98% of the world's vehicles still running internal combustion engines, the pace of change needed to meet the Paris targets is larger and faster than anything we've ever seen in history. And it goes in completely the opposite direction of current emissions trends. The overwhelming consensus is that just pushing for CO2 emission reductions in all those sectors stands absolutely no chance of keeping us within our higher carbon budget of 1200 gigatons, let alone the lower one. So the race is now on to find effective ways to actively remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. And that leads us into the brave new world of negative carbon emissions. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Back in October 2018, the IPCC released this report called Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We looked at it in quite some detail at the time in a series of five videos and you can click up there somewhere to jump back to review the main summary episode. One of the charts they included in the report was this one showing what they call potential emission pathways to 2100. In almost every single scenario they looked at, they needed CO2 emissions to drop into very negative territory to make their numbers add up. As a species, we've only really got two options we can turn to for achieving that. One is technology and the other is nature. The IPCC favour the technological approach. Most of their negative emission pathways rely very heavily on a technology called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS. The idea is that land is set aside to grow a specific set of crops or trees. Those trees and crops pull CO2 out of the atmosphere during the photosynthesis process which makes them grow. You harvest those crops, burn them in power stations to produce electricity and then capture the CO2 that the combustion process produces and bury it underground either on land or out at sea. In 2019, the Drax power station in the UK converted four of its six furnaces to burn biomass instead of coal. Speaking at the launch of the demonstration plant, Kasper Skulderman, director of engineering at Sea Capture, the company that developed the technology, stated, working at this scale is really where the engineering gets interesting. The challenge now is to get all the information we need to design and build a capture plant 10,000 times bigger. It's only really when we get those sorts of scales that we can start to have an impact on the climate. According to the IPCC report, to make their negative emissions calculations work using BEX as the major contributor would require 25-46% to 46 of current arable and permanent cropland to be converted to biomass plantations by 2100, and that's a huge amount of land. This analysis by a group called Avoid2 shows that just 20% of land is an area the size of Australia. And those monocrop biomass plantations would remove ecosystems and biodiversity from large parts of the planet and require enormous quantities of water and nitrogen-based fertilizers to keep them growing at the required levels. They'd also take away the ability of hundreds of millions of indigenous people to grow their own food crops. Despite the grand ambitions shown by the IPCC and power producers like Drax, environmental groups and campaigners claim that Bex technology will, at best, proved to be an unworkable proposition at the kind of scale suggested, and at worst could be a potential ecological and humanitarian catastrophe. So what other get-out-of-jail cards does technology have up its sleeve? 
Well, as many of you will probably have seen, there's been a lot of noise and excitement in the last couple of years around the concept of direct air capture. The idea here is essentially to mount loads of suction fans into container-sized housing units, and then the fans suck in the ambient air from the surrounding atmosphere and force it across a concoction of chemical substances where a reaction takes place that captures the CO2 and lets the clean air carry on back out into the atmosphere. Bill Gates is a big advocate of this option, having personally invested in a company called Carbon Engineering that operates up in Squamish in British Columbia, removing about a tonne of carbon dioxide from the air every day. But Carbon Engineering don't plan on putting that CO2 back in the ground to remove it completely from the system. They're actually combining it with hydrogen that they remove from water to make hydrocarbon fuel to replace existing petrol, diesel and aviation fuels which of course then get burnt in internal combustion engines and jet engines and give all the captured CO2 back to the atmosphere. A second company called Climeworks has operations in Switzerland and Italy where the majority of CO2 captured is sold to farmers to use in their greenhouses to boost crop growth. Climeworks also have a third facility in Iceland where they're actually injecting the captured CO2 into the basalt rock formations on the volcanic island, which can easily store CO2, converting it into solid carbonate locked away a thousand metres underground. Climeworks claim that their technology, even allowing for all the solar panels that would be needed to power the process, would still only use a fraction of the land required by BEX. To remove 8 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, they say they would need just under 16,000 square kilometres of land compared to the 2.5 million square kilometres that BEX would require. But once again, the environmental groups point out that there's a big difference between building a couple of machines that can at best remove about 150 tonnes of CO2 a year and building thousands and thousands of facilities that would be needed to remove 8 billion tonnes a year. This 2019 article by George Monbiot in The Guardian suggests that the amount of steel and concrete required to build those machines could help push the world beyond certain climate tipping points before the positive effects are felt. So there's an increasing focus on how we can embrace and reinstate some of the processes that nature already has in place for drawing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Forests are a fairly obvious place to start. So far in the illustrious history of our species, we humans have got rid of about 50% of all the forests that existed on the planet before we came along. Between 1990 and 2016, according to this report by National Geographic, the world lost another 502,000 square miles, an area of land larger than South Africa. Almost 20% of the Amazonian rainforest has been destroyed in the last 50 years, and during the first 12 months under Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, more than 3,700 square miles of the Amazon has been burnt or cut down, the highest loss in Brazilian rainforest in a decade. According to a 2019 study carried out by researchers at Swiss University ETH Zurich, there are six main countries with land that's been identified as having potential for forest restoration. Russia's the biggest, unsurprisingly, with 151 million hectares. The USA's got about 103 million hectares. Canada has 78 million. Australia's got 58 million hectares. Brazil, 50 million. And China, 40 million. And there are plenty of well-established organisations around the world that are coordinating projects to plant literally billions of new trees, invariably involving local people in the planning and decision-making process to ensure that any regeneration is useful to indigenous people and sustainable into the future. A couple of examples that I've spoken to are We Forest, an NGO formed in 2009 and now spread over three continents and 12 countries, and Plant for Planet in Germany, an amazing enterprise started in 2007 by the then nine-year-old Felix Finkbeiner, based on the idea that children could promote climate justice by planting a million trees in every country. Felix and his team organise workshops where kids learn the tools and knowledge to become ambassadors for climate justice. So far, Plant for the Planet has appointed more than 55,000 climate justice ambassadors and aims to increase that number to 1 million. Plant for the Planet are also involved in the One Trillion Tree Initiative, believe it or not, announced at the 2020 World Economic Forum in Davos. The One Trillion Tree Initiative platform is designed for governments, businesses and civil society to provide support to the United Nations Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which if it's passed you by, is this decade. US President Donald Trump was at the forum when the initiative was announced, and he likes trees and stuff, 
they go very nicely on his golf courses. So he decided to make an announcement that the US government will be fully committing to the initiative, which is nice. As of February 2020, almost 13.64 billion of the 1 trillion trees have already been planted. And it's not just trees in our forests that our scientists are urging us to regenerate, it's also the soil itself. A great deal of carbon in our soils has been released into the atmosphere through poor land management, intensive agriculture and industrial scale livestock farming. Without a healthy carbon rich soil full of organic matter and biodiversity, most species, including our own, would quite simply not exist. But many farmers and agricultural scientists are now showing that carbon can be drawn back in and locked away in our soils by employing smarter strategies that work in step with nature instead of against it. One method grown in popularity is rewilding, which is not, as many people think, just abandoning land and walking away. It's actually all to do with restoring natural processes, structures and species that have been lost from landscapes as a result of overly invasive human activity and allowing nature to bring back a properly balanced and diverse ecosystem of natural succession, animal grazing and predation. Regenerative agriculture is another strategy being embraced more and more by farmers and livestock owners, mainly in Australia and the United States. We took a look at the detail of regenerative agriculture in a couple of earlier videos and you can click up there to jump back to the first of those. And if you're of a more urban disposition, but still want to get involved in something a bit green and restorative, then fear not, because carbon markets are beginning to pop up around the world as well, allowing individuals and companies to offset their carbon emissions, not just by paying landowners not to cut down trees, which tended to be the default practice of the older carbon offset schemes, but by funding projects that are actually removing carbon from the atmosphere and restoring it back into the ground where it belongs. In Australia, organisations like the Carbon Market Institute and the Market Advisory Group help businesses to link up and fund initiatives like the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation and others. These organisations have become known as Carbon Farmers and it's a movement that's growing all around the world. Over in Seattle, an organisation called Norrie is already working to build up what they expect to be a massive marketplace for carbon removal, starting with regenerative agriculture projects. And this is no sandal-wearing commune of hippies. This is becoming a pretty hard-nosed business investment proposition, harnessing all the advantages of a market-driven system to facilitate climate mitigation. Norrie's website tells us this. Carbon removal is going to be a trillion dollar industry. Carbon offsets and removals are already a $200 billion market today. This is only going to grow as governments, corporations and even individuals move to pay for dealing with their greenhouse gas emissions. Norrie's system is based on blockchain. The company says they're market ready for a near future where software systems like theirs will be plugged into different apps and government programs so that every time someone emits a ton of CO2, a payment for removing one ton of CO2 will happen automatically through their system. Each ton of CO2 removed via Norrie costs one Norrie blockchain token, and those tokens are gonna to have to be purchased from people who hold them. So Norrie are attracting a great deal of interest from early investors who've spotted the potential for extremely large profits as the market begins to expand and mature. It might feel a little uncomfortable that we have to incentivize the survival of our species with financial rewards, but that is how our Western market-driven economies work. So these sorts of imaginative entrepreneurial solutions are likely to play a key role if we're to achieve the ultimate goal of preventing uncontrollable climate change. And our oceans can also play a vital role in the negative emissions challenge. No doubt you're aware of Project Drawdown, one of the most comprehensive resources of information about carbon reversal in the world. One of the inspirational visionaries featured on their website is this guy. He's called Brian Von Horsen. Brian was previously a systems engineering consultant, but now devotes his life to reversing global warming using a system called marine permaculture. As we saw last week, oceans face a dire situation. They absorb half the carbon dioxide recaptured from the atmosphere and 90% of the heat from global warming. As a result, areas of ocean deserts are expanding. Van Horsen tells us between Australia and the United States, 
there's a hundred million square kilometers of ocean desert that's amenable to marine permaculture. The goal is to restore primary production of the oceans. Primary production is the creation of organic compounds from carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Van Horsen's system will restore this marine life in subtropical waters with thousands of new kelp seaweed forests. The key technology involves what he calls marine permaculture arrays or MPAs which are lightweight lattice structures about half a square mile in size. The arrays will be submerged about 80 feet below sea level providing a perfect frame for kelp to attach to. Buoys or buoys if you're American are fixed to the lattices and as they rise and fall with the waves they generate power for pumps that bring up colder nutrient rich waters from the deep. The kelp soak up the nutrients as they grow and that sets up what Van Horsen refers to as a trophic pyramid rich in plant and animal life. Plants that don't get eaten eventually die off and drop into the deep sea, locking up carbon for centuries in the form of dissolved carbon and carbonates. It's reckoned that floating kelp forests like these could capture and store away billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide and also provide the world with a highly renewable and sustainable source of food, fertiliser, fibre and perhaps even biofuels. Organisations like Project Drawdown and others are championing hundreds of small and large scale projects in almost every part of the world. And we'll be looking at several more specific initiatives on this channel as we go through 2020 and beyond. There's a good chance there'll be something going on in your neck of the woods that you can probably get involved with either by volunteering your services or by supporting with a funding donation. So if you can, go online and do a bit of web searching. And when you do, make sure you use a search engine called Ecosia. This isn't a paid endorsement, by the way. I don't get any money from Ecosia. I just think it's a bloody good idea. They use all their ad revenue to plant trees in the areas where they're most needed. It's dead easy to use. You just download the app and add it to your current search engine as the default web browser. After that, all your web activity will be generating revenue that's helping to mitigate climate change. That's it for this week. Please give us a like and a share if you found the program useful. And if you haven't already done so, then please consider subscribing to the channel to help raise our profile with the YouTube search algorithms so that we can keep sharing the message of climate change mitigation to as many people as possible each week. And don't forget to hit that little bell icon so you get notified when the new content comes out as well. Big thank you as always to the channel's Patreon supporters who make these programs possible. And if you want to get more involved with the channel, then come and join us at www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think, where you can get access to exclusive content and take part in monthly polls to influence what we talk about in future programs. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.